All right, James, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 6. And I was just sitting there thinking before I get started on the text here. Three of the greatest words that you'll ever hear, God loves you. Boy, what, what tremendous comfort and strength there is to know that God loves me or God loves you. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is with us, he's all we need. We may not think so sometimes, and we may prefer it uh, to have others with us, but really, if God is with us, he can supply everything that we need. So we just need to trust in him. We need to praise him, and we need to look to him and just encourage each other, strengthen each other, in the Lord every day. All right, James, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Father, we bow again before you in this day, thankful for each one that's come out to the Lord's house. And Father, we just come before thee as humbly as we know how, and we just ask you, Lord, that you'll just strengthen your people that you'll help us all, that we can just uh, have victory in the Lord every day. And Father, that you will help us to pray for each other. Help us to hold each other up in prayer. And help us to encourage each other and strengthen each other. And have the fellowship that you want us to have as your people. Now we continue to pray for revival. That's one of the most important things upon our heart today is that you would give us great revival, not only here at Gethsemane Church, and not only in our hearts, but, uh, Lord, in people's hearts across this land, that you'll give us revival. Now bless us tonight, and bless this service, that your will can be done. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach tonight on the subject, Resisting the Devil. In June of 1940, the Nazi army under Adolf Hitler started its occupation of northern and western France. The French army had been defeated at the Battle of France, and once German forces began to occupy, occupy France, a French resistance began to develop. At first it was very small and very ineffective. Charles de Gaulle, a French general who had escaped to Britain, was able to send a man by the name of Jean Mullen to France to unify the various groups. He was able to do that, but the Germans captured him. They tortured him to death, but the French resistance was still there, and it continued after his death. Several things had been done, but these things kind of came to together after uh, Mullen's death. The, the French resistance, first of all, published underground newspapers encouraging the French people to resist the Germans. They helped get Allied pilots whose planes had been shot down back to England. And they organized military raids on uh, various forces of the Germans there in France. After the war, General Dwight D. Eisenhower said that the French resistance was of inestimable, inestimable value in regaining French independence. The Bible tells us the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He is the prince of this world. Jesus said in John the 12th chapter verse 31, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. We understand that the devil's forces are occupying this world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We as the church of Jesus Christ, both individually and collectively, just like the French resistance was individual and collective, 
We as the uh, members of Christ's body, of his church, are the Christian underground in this world. We are fighting the war here in this world until the Lord Jesus Christ returns and destroys uh, the, the forces of Satan and sets up his kingdom. That's what we're looking forward to. In this scripture, James instructs individual Christians to resist the devil. As I preach this message, I want us to think about that in two ways. First of all, in, in our own lives, we must resist Satan. In our own individual families, our own individual lives, that's our job. And, and if we're going to succeed for the Lord, we must resist Satan. And secondly, I would like, like for us to think of it as the church of the living God, because the church of the living God is certainly an army for the Lord. And so we are to join with God's people and do everything that we can to defeat evil in this world, as I said a moment ago, until Jesus comes. So we're standing here tonight, or we're sitting here tonight, whatever the case may be, we've come to worship the Lord. But we're here really to gain strength that we can go out and we can live as God wants us to live and we can do what the Lord wants us to do every day in our life. First of all, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, we resist the devil by submitting to God. Here in this seventh verse, there's a simple little rule. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now that's just a simple little verse. And we need to learn to apply that in our life every day. You see, before we can be of use in, in the church's resistance of, of Satan and evil forces, we must submit ourselves to the Lord. We must come to a place that we're willing to obey Him. First of all, we have to get saved. First of all, we have to be truly born again. We have to surrender our life to Jesus Christ and be sure... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, and be sure that the Holy Spirit is in our heart and we're serving the Lord. I hope tonight you're saved. I hope tonight that you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you came to an altar somewhere and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and you belong to Him and He belongs to you. Because if you don't, I hope before this service is over, you will do that. You will make sure that you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Because let me tell you something. There's too many people today in the church struggling with their, with their loyalties. There's, so, there's too many people struggling to, uh, to see if they're loyal to the world or to see if they're, they're loyal to Christ. It seems like they can't make up their mind. Whether to dedicate their life to Christ and be a dedicated Christian or to live like the world. You find people, I hear pastors talk and, and I read uh, different things, different places. And, and you know, the church is having a lot of trouble. A lot of young people are leaving the church. Young people who said they were saved. Young people who came to the altar were baptized and said, yes, I'm a born again Christian. A lot of young people, young people are leaving the church and they're, they're, having, a they're having trouble deciding where their loyalty really is. As you can look around tonight, there's church pews, they're empty. And it's not just here. It's across this country. There's a lot of folks that, that are uh, at home watching television or, or out at uh, uh, one of the stores tonight who, who say that I'm a born again Christian. I, I went to an altar, I got saved, I was baptized, and I went through the, the motions of being a Christian. But they're not in church anymore. A lot of people church hopping. You know, they have a little problem here. Something doesn't just go their way like they want it to, and they go over there. You know, in order to be an effective soldier for Jesus Christ, we need to surrender our heart to the Lord and live as he wants us to. We have dual citizenship in this country. Did you know that? Since about 1990, uh, whenever you're a naturalized citizen, Many of us are born citizens to this country, but when you're a naturalized citizen, you take a, an oath of allegiance where, where you, you, you take an oath that you, you're not going to be loyal. I don't know it exactly by heart, but you really you disavow any loyalty to any prince or any king or any other government in the world. People who are naturalized still have to take that oath. But they can be a citizen of this country 
and a citizen of another. I suppose it would be possible to be a citizen of the United States and be a citizen of Syria or a citizen of Iran. I suppose it would be possible. In fact, I know it's happened that you can vote in Mexico and come north. If you're a citizen in both countries, you can vote in Mexico and vote in America. It seems that some people are having trouble deciding which country they want to be a part of. You know, we as Christians have to decide if we're going to surrender to the Lord or if we're going to follow the devil and follow the world. You see, the first step in resisting the forces of evil is to, to submit our life to Christ. Jesus made that point. You say, preacher, you're preaching awfully tough tonight. I'm not preaching half as tough as the prophets did. I'm not preaching half as tough as Jesus did. Listen to Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 24. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You know, when a person's truly saved, he doesn't straddle a fence. Amen? I, I use this term, and it's not a biblical term. You know you're saved or you're not saved. You really can't get really saved. You're either saved or you're lost. But I use this term today because a lot of people today, you know, they get saved and they don't seem like they're really saved. And so I say, you know, when somebody gets saved, I like to see somebody get really saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. A man named Jim got a job in a factory. And it was a good job. He was thrilled to get the job. And... Uh, he was, he was glad it, the, the, the job paid a good wage. It had good benefits. It had good working conditions. He was just thrilled to be there, and he was thrilled to tell his, his family, and he was thrilled to tell his, his friends that he had got a job in this certain factory, and everybody was just happy for him. But Jim was the kind of guy that he wasn't a real good worker. And he liked to talk to other people. And a lot of times he would go in on his, on his shift and he would spend a lot of time uh, fraternizing with the other workers. And uh, the boss would say to him, Jim, you've got to make your quota. And sometimes he would make it and sometimes he didn't make it. And he just kind of took that job lightly. You could just see him in dear various places whenever uh, nights that maybe he didn't get as much work done as, as, as he should get on. He was over talking to this person. He was over talking to that person because he just liked to talk to people. One night the boss called him into the office and he said, Jim, we've tried and we've tried. But said, you just won't buckle down and work. He said, it takes dedication to work this job and we're looking for dedicated workers. And Jim said, oh, I like my job. He said, I, I tell everybody. I, I, I tell everybody where I work, and I tell everybody how good it is. And the boss said, I know that's true, probably true. But he said, i got to let you go, Jim, because we want people, when they come into those doors out there, we want you to come to work to work. You know, the first step in resisting the devil is to get on God's side. The first, the first step in resisting the devil is to surrender our life to Christ and live as God wants us to live. And folks, let me tell you, it's important to resist. It's important to resist the devil. It's important to resist temptation. It's important to live the way the Lord wants us to live. Secondly, to resist the devil, we have to learn how to be a good soldier. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, a good soldier has to learn how to fight the enemy. The army takes people and they don't just pick somebody up off the street and give them a uniform and a rifle and a backpack and, and the tools of, of being a military person and send them into battle. Our military understands that Soldiers have to be trained. So when someone is taken into the military, uh, they join the military, the first thing they do is send them to basic training. they got to get them in shape. Most people need to be put in shape. They have to run. They have to learn even, they have to even learn how to, to eat uh, sea rations and things like that. And so then they, they give them a rifle and they teach them, uh, they, they spend a great deal of time teaching them to use the rifle. They give them other tools and they give them other things and they spend a lot of time in basic training teaching them to be soldiers. Then once basic training is over, there's AIT. They send them off for individual training. 
And they send them specialized training, and they teach them even more before they send them into battle. Because the, the, the army knows that a soldier has to be trained, and he has to know how to use his weapons to go into battle and to be an effective soldier. You know, to resist the devil, we must learn to use our spiritual weapons. And let me tell you something. This is the greatest spiritual weapon the world has ever seen. This is the Word of God. It will apply to any situation. There is no situation that you can get yourself into that, this, that, that, that the, the Word of God will not help you. It's, folks, listen, it's not only a source of comfort. It's not only a source of strength. The Bible, the, the Bible says of itself, it's the sword of the Spirit. Listen, we would no more go out to fight a lion than, uh, without a weapon and know how to use that weapon. We wouldn't anymore send soldiers into battle without weapons to know how to use that weapon than anything in the world. But sometimes we as Christians, we try to fight the devil and not know how to use the sword of the Spirit. It's important that we not only know the scripture, it's important that we know how to use it. You know, to neglect the Bible is to be ignorant of God's wisdom. But you know, there's another weapon that's just as valuable, and that is prayer. Oh, how important it is. As we resist Satan, individually, we cannot, we cannot resist the devil's temptations without God's help. We cannot resist the things of the world without a lot of prayer. Let me tell you something, folks. Being a Christian, a, an effective Christian, I don't know about you, but I want to be an effective Christian. Amen? I want, I want to be able to accomplish things for God. I want to have victory in my Christian life. I don't want to walk around defeated all the time. I want to be an effective soldier. I want to live for the Lord. I want to have an effective Christian life. And to do that, we have to learn to use the weapon of prayer. John Bunyan said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. See, God wants us to labor for him and to work for him. Uh, we're promoting winning souls. And we're going to continue to promote winning souls. That's what this church is about. But you know, before we can win souls, we have to get a hold of God. Before we can do anything for the Lord, there has to be, there has to be travailing prayer. Robert Murray McSheen said, What a man is on his knees before God, that is he, and nothing more. Sidlow Baxter said, Men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. I want to read that to you again. I, I, you know, I'm thinking of cutting that out and pasting it up on my desk. What a tremendous statement that is. Listen to what, listen to what he said. Men, he, here's a man who knew something about the power of prayer. He said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. You want, you want to see somebody get saved? Get in your closet. Get down on your knees and travail and pray and beg God and get a hold of the Lord until you know that he has touched you, until you know that you have a peace in your heart, to know that you've been with God. Listen, God can do more to change a heart than we can. Amen. See, it takes prayer. You want to see somebody, you see somebody in trouble, you see a fellow Christian in need and, and you would love, your heart goes out to them and there's just nothing you can do for them. You, you, they have to go through this by themselves. My friends, you can get in your closet, get out on your knees and get a hold of God because there's something he can do. You say there's somebody far away. Oh, I wish I was there. I wish I could help them. I wish I could witness to them. I wish I could do something for them. Go into your closet. Get out on your knees and get a hold of God because they're not too far away that God can't touch them. Hallelujah. You want a preacher that will preach? You want your church filled with the Holy Spirit? You want souls to be saved? Go into your closet. Get out on your knees and get a hold of God and continue to travail in prayer and it'll happen. 
You see, whatever else we do to resist the forces of evil, we must learn to pray. We must pray fervently. The scripture tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's two things there. You know, effectual means to order your prayer. It means to think about your prayer, to put it in order. You know, when we go to prayer, we're going before God. We're going, it's just, if we were going into with the, before the President of the United States and, and we had some requests, we wouldn't just go in there and, and we wouldn't wait till we got there and say, well, you know, I'm going to go in and whatever comes to my mind, that's what I'm going to ask. Now, I pray like that sometimes and God knows what's on my heart. Amen. His spirit inter intercedes with my spirit. I understand that kind of prayer. But what I'm saying about the Bible says when we go before God, we need to order our prayer like a lawyer in court, like an attorney in court orders his argument. We, know we need to go before God and give him, our, give him our thoughts and ask him for our needs. Effectual. Fervent. Means to pray. To put yourself into it. To be energetic in prayer. Now I know we can't sit down at the table most of the time. We say table grace and we, we pray in public and, and I'm, very, I'm a very conscious person. Uh, it's difficult for me to pray in public. Even after all these years as a preacher, it's, it's difficult for me to really let my go, myself go in prayer. It's difficult even before my wife. It's hard for me. But I tell you, I get home with God sometimes and I pound the floor. Get up and walk. Get out on my face. And plead with God. You see, prayer has to be fervent. God wants, to know, God wants us to put ourselves into it. Jesus prayed until sweat ran down like great, great drops of blood. He didn't just say, he didn't just say a, 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 a kind of a generic prayer. Listen, he put himself into it. He put everything he had into it. That's the kind of prayer God hears. We must pray fervently. We must pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, what is praying in the Holy Ghost? It's putting ourselves in the will of God. And it's praying with a, with a life that's backed up by holiness. It's praying with a life that, that honors God and praises God and pleases God. And it's praying fervently in the Holy Ghost. We must pray for results. You know, we need to be careful about taking these prayer requests to the Lord and cluttering up the box. Now God hears, he tells us to be careful for nothing, amen? To, to let a request be, uh, be made known with thanksgiving, let a request be made known to God. God's concern, it doesn't matter how small it is. Listen, young people, your prayers are powerful. God's concern, and listen folks, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how small it is, if you need to talk to God, He's your friend. He's there to talk to you. Hallelujah. But you know, I think God gets really upset with us when we say we really need something, we really want something, we pray about it a day or two, and then we forget it. Or we pray about it a little while, and then we give up. Jesus prayed for results. We need to pray for results. You see, we, meet, we need to learn to use the weapon of prayer. Oh, what could be wrought in this country tonight? And I'm telling you, if you don't know by now that we're in a lot of trouble, God help you. But what could be wrought in this country if God's people would get out on their knees and cry out to the Lord in fervent prayer? What would God do for America if his people would cry out to him like he wants us to? We need to learn to use 
the weapon of prayer. We must pray without ceasing. Paul said he prayed all the time. You can pray walking. You can pray cooking. You can pray driving. Now keep your eyes on the road. God don't want you to close your prayer, close your eyes and run into somebody. But you can pray driving, you can pray walking, you can pray in church, you can pray at home. We need to pray all the time as much as we possibly can. We need to pray without ceasing. If we want to see results, if we want to use the weapon of prayer, we can pray. If we pray without ceasing, God hears those kind of prayers. One more thing. We must pray without discouragement. Faith is what prayer is about. To be able to pray, to believe, and doubt not in our heart. You know, you know where faith comes from? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith comes from this book. Faith comes from knowing the Word of God. And faith comes from just being close to the Lord. Let me ask you tonight. Are you a prayer warrior? Do you know how to get out on your knees and get a hold of God and pray until you see the victory? You know, when, God man, when God's man prays in earnest, something has to happen. Amen. I have, I've spoken about Terrell Allman a few times. Told you a little bit about the revival that took place when I was in college down in southeast Missouri. But here was a young man, I think he was 17 years old. And God just used him in revivals, big revivals. There was just nothing going on until this young man would get up and, and preach and people would flock to the altar. Church after church he would go to. Wherever he went there was there were souls saved. For a long time there was revival. One man told me one time, and I was privileged to know the young man. I'd spent time with him in prayer, spent time with him in Bible study. I knew his secret. But a man told me one time, you know, he said, I get up and preach. He said, I get up and preach a great sermon. He said, I, I, I study and I preach and, and I put in an order and I preach a great sermon. And he said, nobody comes. He said, he gets up, takes his Bible, says a few words, preaches about five minutes, cries a little bit, and the altar gets full. Well, it wasn't that Terrell Oman knew how to preach. If you had been with him very long, but you knew that when you were with him very long, he knew how to pray. Oh, I tell you, I went in one night to an altar. Uh, it, was after, it was after church. We were walking down the street, and he said, Brother Owens, he said, I just feel like I need to go pray. He said, will you go pray with me? And I said, yes, I will. We went into the church, went up to the front, got out on the altar, and we were there for quite a while. I don't know how long we were there. I prayed, he prayed, we both prayed. I'll never get up, I'll never forget getting up and we hugged and as we started to walk away I noticed a puddle of tears on the altar. I think it's better to know how to pray than it is to know how to preach. I think it's better to know how to pray than to know how to witness. You see we need to learn to use the weapon of prayer. You see to resist the devil we must know how to pray. The third thing I'd give you tonight to resist the forces of darkness, we must not harden our heart. Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 7 and 8. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. You see, the secret to having the Lord's power. Let me give this to you. Power comes through Bible study. So many Christians today have trouble in their Christian walk because they don't study their Bible. It's preached and taught, at least in this church. Some churches don't even preach it anymore from what I understand. But it's preached and taught. Brother Dickens preaches study your Bible. I preach study your Bible. You're going to hear that when you come. You say, I'm tired of that. I'm sorry, you're going to hear it. It's important. Power comes from knowing, knowing the Word of God. Power comes from prayer. That's what I've been, I've been preaching on. But let me tell you something. If we're going to have results from God, if we're going to resist the devil, power comes from obedience. You see, now the idea is being taught today 
in some Christian circles that you can have the Lord's blessings without the Lord's presence. No, you can't. No, you can't. We have to have the Holy Spirit. Everybody say amen. amen. Man, this service is nothing without the Holy Spirit. My sermon is nothing without the Holy Spirit. I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal without the love of God, without charity, without the Holy Spirit. This service is nothing. We must have the Holy Spirit and we must, we, must, we must walk with God every day. And when God says do it, we must do it. When God says don't do it, we must not do it or he will not give us his power. Oh, how important it is to be humble before the Lord. Let me take you back. You don't have to turn there. But let me take you back to uh, the time of Moses Number 16, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Korah was a member of the tribe of Levi. And they got together a group of folks, 250 famous princes. They didn't like Moses' leadership. They didn't like him having authority. And they protested to him. He, they said, you take too much upon you because we're all, we all have the Spirit of God. You take too much upon you. This great man of God. They said that too. I think if, I think if Moses had appointed at them and said, God, take them, I think God would have took them right there. I don't know that, but I think, I think he had that kind of power with God. You know what Moses did? The scripture says he fell on his face before them. Because Moses was the most humble man in the Old Testament. He fell on his face. He wasn't proud. He wasn't leading God's people to lift himself up. He wasn't trying to make a name for himself. He was just trying to do the job God wanted him to do. And he loved those people. Lord, he said one time, Lord, if it's your will, take my name out of the book, but don't take theirs out. He fell on his face. He said, let's go up to the tabernacle. <laughs> let's go up to the tabernacle and pray about it. And they did. And God took care of it because the earth opened up and swallowed these people up. Moses had a tender heart and he had power with God. Hezekiah didn't refuse to do the Lord's will over in Isaiah the 38th chapter verse 3 and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Old Hezekiah was a good soldier, folks. When the Lord said do, he did. And when the Lord said don't, he didn't. Listen, that's the secret to serving the Lord is obedience. Just serving God and just being ready and be willing. You know, I, I'm reminded of a little story I heard about a, a little boy that, that uh, uh, came out of his room and said, Oh, mommy, oh, mommy, oh, mommy, you, the Lord has blessed me so much. And, and I don't remember the exact thing that he was wanting, but he wanted something. And he said, Mommy, the Lord's given it to me. And his mom said, Well, did you have to pray a long time? He said, no, Mommy, the Lord asked me to do something. And he said, I obeyed right away. I think that's what God's looking for. You see, God's looking for someone who will live all out for him. Someone who will read their Bible. Someone who will pray. Someone who will obey him. A preacher looked down at D.L. Moody one time. Or he was in a service where a preacher said, you know, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man who will give his whole self to him. God can do great things with us if we are willing to obey him. Over in Psalm 66, verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You know, half-heartedness will never serve the Lord. Uh, in World War II, some historians say that the Italians were not very good fighters. It wasn't that they didn't fight some good battles. 
It wasn't that some of their, some of their battles were very good and some of, their, some of their soldiers were tremendously good. But the historian says, some of the historians say overall they were not really committed to the battle. And they were not prepared, their, their, their generals were not really committed to it, they were not committed to it. And he said in a, in a lot of cases the Italian soldiers would give up to the enemy rather than go through the hardships of war. They would, they would lay down their arms and give up. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Are you working every day to resist Satan individually? And are you wanting so much to be a part of God's church that you can be a great, uh, be a part of this great battle that's going on until Jesus comes? I don't know what God's got for me, but I want to be in the battle. Amen. I want to be. I want to do something for the Lord. I want. I don't want. I don't want the rest of the church to fight and to stand up and, and if necessary, be persecuted and whatever takes place. I don't want the rest of the church to do it and, and me stand on the sidelines. I want to be a part of the battle. I want to be a warrior for the Lord. But it takes prayer and it takes obedience. The last thing. To resist the devil and win the victory over evil, we must be willing to endure. <coughs> James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. When he is tried, we're all going to be tried, folks. From the moment you come to the altar and accept Jesus Christ, the devil's going to be on your trail. And he's going to do everything he can to trip you up. He's going to do everything he can. He's going to do everything he can to defeat you. If he can't defeat you, he'll discourage you. If he can't discourage you, he'll try to get you interested in the world. If he can't get you interested in the world, he'll try, he'll try to discredit you somehow. The devil is on your trail from the moment you come to this altar and it's going to take endurance to defeat him. In Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 17, it says, And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a, for a time afterward when an affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. Seed sown among the thorns. <laughs> How many of you think you've been sown among the flowers? No, we're sown among the thorns, aren't we? And to, and to live the Christian life and to have victory, folks, it takes some strength. We're going to get knocked down. At times we're going to think that we're going to, at times we're going to think the devil's winning this war. He's already defeated. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Everybody say amen. Jesus has already gone out on the battlefield. He's already gone to the cross. He's already died. And he rose from the grave. Hallelujah. He's already won the victory. All he wants us to do is fight the battle. Be good soldiers. Resist the devil. Do it individually. Resist him in our, with, with our own personal Christian testimony. Resist the devil in our families. Resist the devil in our churches. Be a part of a good Bible-believing church and fight the devil with everything you've got until Jesus comes. Hallelujah. You know, I've spoken a lot about World War II tonight. World War II lasted six years and one day. Historians tell us it started September the 1st, 1939 to September the 2nd, 1945. Six years and one day. You can always find dissenters. I don't like war. I wish there was never a war. In heaven there won't be. But I think most people would say that World War II was a necessary war. 
The Nazis were on the march. They were trying to conquer the world. And it took six years and one day to win that war. Let me tell you something. What if we'd have stopped at six years? It wouldn't have been enough. They'd have, they, <coughs> the Germans were beaten, but if we had stopped with six years, they would have drawn back, marshaled their forces. They would have reinforced their troops. They would have, they would have done whatever it was necessary to, to refurbish their war machine, and they would have marched on. It took six years, and one day, it took endurance to beat Hitler. And you know, to resist the devil takes endurance. You win the battle over temptation today, you knock the devil out through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the only way you're going to do it, through the grace of God. You, you win today. You'll be right back tonight. He won't wait till tomorrow. He'll be right back tonight. You see, to be the kind of Christian that I believe we want to be, I believe every person comes to the altar, prays for salvation, wants to succeed. I believe every child of God here tonight wants to succeed. And you know, God has given us every opportunity to succeed. Think of what the Lord's done. He's given us, he's given us His Holy Spirit in our heart. Amen? Amen. We, have the, we have the unction of the Spirit. We have, we have the Holy Spirit in our heart. The He that's in you is greater than He that's in the world. God put a part of Himself inside of you, Christian. Say Amen! Say amen. He's given you the Word of God. There is nothing... There is nothing this book cannot repel. There is nothing that can attack this book successfully. There is no team of atheists. There is nobody in the world. The whole world can attack this book. They can burn it. They can destroy it. They can do whatever they want to. God will rewrite it if he has to. He's given us prayer. Oh, you want to see something changed? Pray about it. Pray about it. Get others to help you pray about it. Pray about it. And folks, it takes endurance. Simply to submit ourselves to God and live for Him every day as close as we possibly can and be the person God wants us to be. And let me tell you something. There's some promises in the Word of God. If we submit ourselves to God, if we resist the devil, and God draws nigh to us, God's going to use us. I don't know what He'll use you for, but He'll use you. Judith, He'll use you. Praise the Lord. Brother Brown, He'll use you. All we need to do is just surrender our heart to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. If we come to God and pray and do these things and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. God will use us every day. What more can we ask? Let me ask you tonight. Is he using you? Are you resisting the devil? Are you drawing nigh to God every day? <laughs>